Good morning. Amen, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, if you have your Bibles, John 4, John 4, verse 23. That's where we're going to begin today, John 4, 23. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Wow, this is Jesus talking. This is so powerful. It's, it's interesting, in the book of John, A.W. Pink has, has three musts in the book of John. And it's verse 3, 7, which talks about being born again. You must be born again. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. And in 3.14, that the Son of Man must be lifted up. And then he goes into chapter 4, and those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth when they're worshiping the Father. It starts off by talking about being born again. You're born again of the Spirit. And when that Spirit is leading you to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who was lifted up for our salvation. And once we understand what it means to have the new Spirit and the new birth, we then look to the Father and we commune with Him. Those verses build a backbone of John, the book of John. So as we think about what this is saying to us, <laughs> we need to consider the world versus God, spirit, truth. Years ago, we all know of a man named Howard Hughes. There's been movies about him. Hey, it wasn't that long ago that he died. And he owned a, a bunch of casinos in Las Vegas. So when he died, um, his public relations, public relations director said, well, let's take one minute of silence to remember him. And for one minute, all the casinos stopped. All the clanging, all the noise, they all stopped. And after one minute, one of the pit bosses in, in his casinos looked at his watch and said, Okay, roll the dice. He's had his minute. Isn't that the world? And yet the world lifts people up, humans up, so much. But that's not us. That's not the Christian. The Christian changes that, and he lifts up God. There's a story about a child, though, a little story about a child. And he said, after attending church one Sunday, he knelt beside his bed, and he was talking to the Lord. And he said, dear God, we had a good time at church today but I wish you had been there. See, when, when billionaire Howard Hughes died and they had a moment of silence, he, he had no understanding. He wasn't there. But when we gather for church, when we gather in fellowship, when we gather in spirit and in truth, God must needs be here with us. Otherwise, it's a, a dead worship. It's a worship without the emotion of the Holy Spirit surging through us and teaching us and guiding us as we worship the God who created us for fellowship with him. That, the idea that worship is communing with our Lord in all things. A lot of times it's, it's kind of hard for people to define, well, what do you mean by worship? What is worship? Is worship just when we're singing? Is worship just when we're in, in the sermon? Well, there's a few definitions of worship, but worship is all-encompassing. John MacArthur says, Worship is our innermost being. It's intrinsic. It's within us. Responding with praise for all that God is through our attitudes, actions, thoughts, and words based on the truth of God as he has revealed himself. Worship is all that we are and re reacting rightly to all that he is. Supporting verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. That is 
worship. We always say, oh, worship and praise. Praise is our heart being filled unto the Lord and it coming out of us in word and song. And that is part of worship, but it's under the umbrella of worship. All that we are every day when our life is God-centered. That is worship. When our life is man-centered, that is not worship. When we're looking to humans for things that we need, or we're looking to them to fill some gap in us. That is not worship. It's idol worship. It's false worship. But true worship, true worship only comes from God. Jonah said, he said it like this in Jonah 1.9, 1, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. It's just encompassing everything, everything. In Romans 12, it says our whole life is a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice of worship. In Psalm 95, 1 and 2, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. That proclamation we've been talking about over and over again. It says, let us come therefore before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song, lifting our lips up in praise. Worship. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. What is worship? It is the all-consuming practice of the Christian's life as a God-centered, God-focused, God-proclaiming, God-believing new child, new creation of God. So let's look at John 4, 23, one of our core verses here. And Jesus says, but the hour is coming and is now here. Isn't that great? He's talking to the Samaritan woman. You guys know the story. Or he's talking to the Samaritan woman. And he says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. Isn't that awesome? I, we, we read this, we don't always stop and reflect on it. Our God who created us for relationship and to worship him seeks us out. Go back just to the beginning of this chapter, verse 1. And it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John. Oh, they didn't like that. It says, Although Jesus did not baptize, but only his disciples, but under his authority, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Okay. First and foremost, Jesus did not have to pass through Samaria in the sense that many of the Pharisees would go the long way around. But Jesus had to pass through it because he was seeking and saving the lost and he was going to where they were. I love that. God, God has this desire to seek worshipers for him. So Jesus, instead of going the way of what people considered righteous and going around that sinful Samaria, Jesus says, that right there is my mission field. Why would I go around it? I'm going right into it. Right into this, what would be considered a bedrock of apostasy by the religious elites. And he continues, he says, So he came to a town of Samaria, Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples gone away into the city to buy food. Jesus is sitting there waiting, waiting for this encounter, knowing that she's coming, knowing how it's all going to happen. He's waiting for her just as he waits for us. Jesus is always waiting on our hearts too. He was waiting before we came. He's waiting on us now to have a drink with him, to have time to spend with him, to sit with him 
and talk with him. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus was breaking all kinds of norms. And Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. He included all of us Gentiles, those who were unclean, unrighteous, not under the blood of Abraham. Jesus goes, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. And I'm going to talk with them, and I'm going to share the truth with them. Just as that's Jesus' mission field, like we talked about last week, it's our mission field too, to go where they say, why would you have a dealing with me, you Christian? You who claim to have the truth. Because that truth is the offering that God gives to all who seek him. And Jesus answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying it to you, give me a drink. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Living water. And the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You know, we, 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 get, we, we understand these terms as Christians. All living water, the living water is the word of life that comes from the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And... and, and, and we kind of are nonchalant about it. This, Jesus is saying, I am the water of life that I give to you. And he's given it to all of us. And sometimes we don't even, we don't even take it off the shelf. My brother-in-law told me about an object lesson. And, and I didn't do it today because we don't have any flour at the house. But he put flour inside his Bible and he opened it at it opened it and went whew, as if it was dust. So many Christians have a Bible that is covered in dust. The living water of life that we get to take and share. Remember last week, ambassadors for Christ, ministers of reconciliation. Jesus is giving us the example right here, what that looks like in the life of all of us who are his children. And she, go, she goes on and says, Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well to drink from itself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. That water that I give will become in him in you and in me, a water welling up with eternal life. Damon mentioned earlier, it's very important to know who we are worshiping. This whole study here today is the who, the what, and the where of worship. The who, of course, is very important. Are you greater than our father Jacob? They were looking to their spiritual fathers. And they were hoping that because Mount Gerasim had this well and had been an altar they think had been put there by Moses at one time, that they could worship there. And Jesus was coming to say, well, part of the conflict, let me back up historically, was that not only had they inbred with local peoples that were not Jewish, they were also worshiping at the wrong mountain. In Gerasim instead of in Jerusalem. In Samaria instead of Jerusalem and Israel. So they were looked on the wrong way. But let's get back to it a minute. Let's look at the who. Who? Does it matter who we worship? Let's put it, does it matter what we worship? First and foremost, absolutely. The who is vital. The what is vital. And who we worship is God, the creator of heaven and earth. So the question is, <clears throat> does everyone worship God? He starts off by saying true worshipers. True worshipers. Meaning there must be a truth behind your worship. This God that we worship. Right now we have a, 
a Congress that wants to take away pronouns, gender pronouns, that wants to take away any term relating to a God with any specificity. They want the who to be whatever who or what, being it a wooden idol or money or whatever you decide it to be. Does it give you satisfaction? Then fine, that's, that's what you can do. Does it, does it make you feel a bit fulfilled? Sure. Does it not affect you negatively with any of your sensibilities? Well, then go for that one. I don't know if you guys remember from our studies, but in Hinduism, there's over 330 million gods. You can just pick one that you fancy. Usually it's based on your family, but you can change if one has more things to your liking. And that's okay. To them, the who is, well, I could never go to all the who's in my lifetime. Too many. That just means you're passing your ideas around, your opinions around. It means nothing. First and foremost, true worshipers, true worshipers that God is seeking must understand the God that they are worshiping. The word Yahweh the Tetragrammatron, is mentioned 7,000 times in the Old Testament. That's not a little. Do you, it, it, and some of it is it's from names, L, added on, all these different ways. It's there in their face constantly. In the names of God, in the names of the patriarch, in the names of the towns. And it's just L, L, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. The I am is mentioned as the only acceptable, the only acceptable object of worship. The question is and should be for everybody. Do you know who you worship? Now, this is fascinating because most people will say something along the lines of, I'm spiritual, or I worship God. And they have no definition of what God is. God is whatever they've decided God should be. We call that a God of their own making. The who is whatever they agree to be the who. But I tell you what, just like your parents, if they are your parents, gave you boundaries, restrictions, which were also accompanied with an unconditional love, still that boundaries and restriction, those boundaries and restrictions were very loving. Versus, and sadly, a child who ha doesn't know who their parents are, and perhaps they live in a, 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 a nunnery or a, some home that just has a lot of older people there, and they really don't know who their parents are. And the boundaries are either too restrictive so that they're always angry or they're not restrictive at all. Well, this example applies to us. We have to understand who we are worshiping. Know who you are worshiping. Understand the God that you serve. It's interesting because a lot of people will will say that they're worshiping God, and they know they're not. But even worse, a lot of people will say that they're worshiping God, and they think they are. When we gather here today, it's so important, every time we gather, for us to define our object of worship. Because if we have the wrong object of worship, our worship counts for nothing. Let's look at a wrong object of worship. Damon tried to play this earlier. <clears throat> First, I, I, before I, I read what this man said, I don't want us to take lightly the who in worship or the what in worship. If you or anyone thinks that calling upon a false god means nothing, you're sadly mistaken. 
putting your faith in a false god you think means nothing, you're also sadly mistaken. The term invocation <clears throat> means to <laughs> invoke. I know that seems redundant, but let me define it from dictionary.com. The act of invoking or calling upon a deity, a spirit, etc., for aid, protection, inspiration, or the like, or supplication, or any petitioning or supplication for help or aid, a form of prayer invoking God's presence, especially one said at the beginning of a religious service or a public ceremony. The act of calling upon a spirit by incantation, using magic or formulas to conjure up a spirit, an incantation to invoke. The heaviness of invoking a false spirit is nothing to take lightly. And the frightening and damaging effects. So what happened at the opening of Congress? A man named Emmanuel Cleaver, who's a Democrat, who also calls himself a minister in the Methodist church. As I, Sadly, many Methodists have denied who Yahweh really is. So he prays. And I'll read a little bit of the end here. And dear I ask, O Lord, peace even in this chamber now and evermore. Cleaver said while he was serving the house guest chaplain, We ask in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and lowercase, of course, God, known by many names, by many different faiths, a man and a woman. He is a moron. <laughs> but it's worse than that. It's not just saying, oh, that was stupid. His object of worth, worth um, of, sorry, his object of worship is demonic. He's calling on Brahma. He's calling on lowercase gods. There are evil entities behind every idol. In fact, throughout history, evil entities will just switch from name to name based on their culture. And you can see by the attributes that they're the same entity. This is, this invoking here, this false, insincere worship isn't just insincere. It's actually calling upon a spiritual war over our House of Congress. Who you worship makes a very, very big difference. Let's look a little bit at the where of worship. Where is God found? Is he only found on a mountain? Is he only found in Jerusalem? You know, it's pretty amazing. In fact, it's amazingly amazing that God is found everywhere. And now that Jesus has come, God isn't found on a mountain or properly worshipped in Israel. He's worshipped in our hearts. He always was, even in the Old Testament. Don't get me wrong. But they had duties that they had to perform as a special people, a peculiar people set aside for a purpose. But now, and the time has come, that we worship only in spirit and in truth. God in Jeremiah, where's God found is my heading. Jeremiah 23 says, I am a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away. Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord? God, by the way, is everywhere. If you think there's a place that you can go that God does not see you, you are wrong. The world often says, I hope God isn't looking at this, what I'm about to do. There's people, and, and I have talked to them in different religions where God is supposed to be oft forgiving, but they say, I'm going to go sin today. I hope Allah is not looking at me. I heard them say things like that. Christians, children of God, 
You think your parents had eyes to know what you were doing? God sees everything. That is why we are to be worshipful in all of our actions. So in verse 21 of John 4, when he says, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem where you worship the Father. You know, it's nice if we go to Jerusalem. I'm sure many of you have been there. And it'd probably be amazing to go through and see all the places in the first century where they found churches. And even to see the churches there. I remember traveling through Europe. I loved to see the cathedrals. They were beautiful. They were gorgeous. They were monuments to man. They claimed that they were monuments to God. Don't get me wrong. The Old Testament temple was a monument. But it was a type and a shadow. We are not in a cathedral here. If we were, that would be fine too. But we're not. We're in a simple church. This is how much it doesn't matter about the building. During the Reformation, you would have, so you had a bunch of Catholic churches who suddenly turned reformed. So they didn't want Catholic symbols, so they often, and this was interesting, would change the symbols on the spires to roosters, the, the, the calling <laughs> on the Lord. Um, they didn't want the Catholic cross, and then it would switch hands again, and if it became Catholic, they'd put the Catholic cross back on. And if, it did, if the cathedral became Protestant, they'd put whatever they wanted to put on, or they'd take it off completely. For a while, they took a bunch off completely and just said, we're not having a symbol. The building didn't matter. It didn't matter if we meet here. The where doesn't matter because the where is not outside. The where is here, right here. Philippians 3, 3 says, For we are the true circumcision. We, the body of Christ, are the true circumcision. We worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. In John 3, 6, just so I get it right, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We worship in spirit now. The time of the flesh is gone. The time for us in the flesh is gone. We are in the spirit. That's how God wants to communicate with us. This hasn't changed, though. It's changed the way the Spirit stays within us permanently. But this desire of worship, even under the Old Testament laws, existed. In Deuteronomy 3, uh, 6, 3, if you guys, Deuteronomy 6 is where we get the Shema. Deuteronomy 6 is so powerful in its heart for the Lord. I'm going to start at verse 3, and it says, Hear therefore, O Israel. And be careful to do them, that they may go well with you. Talking about the laws. That you may multiply greatly as the Lord. The God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. God saying, I want to bless you. And he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, Christians, the object of your worship is God alone. You shall love, 6-5, you shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And that these words that I command you will be on your heart. Worship, true worship, that God seeks out for his people has always been on the heart. It's never been just outward duty. The Old Testament has established the archetypes that we use and the typologies that we use to understand what Jesus' sacrifice meant, and it is vital that they were established. But even then, God said, our relationship is based on your heart. Our relationship is based on you having a right thinking about me. No matter where you are, when Moses would meet with God in the tent of meeting, he wasn't in the Holy of Holies. God says, I'll meet you here. When we wake up in the morning, God says, I'm here. Do you want to meet? 
And when we're driving, God says, I'm here. Do you want to meet? Do you want to talk? Albert Barnes says it this way about worshiping God in the spirit. A pure, a holy, a spiritual worship, therefore, is such as he seeks the offering of the soul rather than the formal offering of the body. The I live, I move, I have my being. I said that last week. It is so true. Everything that we are. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians like this. Whatever you do, you eat or drink. Everything you do is for the glory of God. Everything. Hebrews 13 says, Through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, acknowledging his name. Why is this important? Because we can think that we're being sincere and be lost. All true worship is sincere worship, but not all sincere worship is true. Should I say that again? All true worship is sincere, but not all sincere worship is true. There are many people who are sincere. They sincerely believe that they are doing what God wants them to do. All religions have people who are devout. And they think, if I do this, God will look upon me favorably. And God says, I want your spirit. Spirit, broken, old flesh, the new spirit inside of you. And from there, our relationship is developed. But many people come before the Lord and they do their outward tasks. They do their devout actions and they think, I am good. In Matthew 15, 8, Jesus addresses this and he says, these people, they honor me with their lips. Meaning they go and they talk about Jesus and they talk about God. They'll even proclaim his name in the streets with other people. But then he says, but their heart, their spirit, their soul, their inner being, what truly motivates them where their desires are is far from me, he says. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, saying, if you do this, God will smile upon you. If you do this, you'll be right with God. If you do this, you've got your get out of hell free card right here. God says, in vain do they do this. It means nothing. All worship must be based on the proper object of our faith, and based in our heart, in our spirit. God is spirit. He is everywhere at all times. And in the sense, just as God, the Father is intangible, the spirit inside of us is also intangible, and that is what is fully worshiping God. In our flesh, we do things in service, but in our worship, it is in the places that we can't see and we can't touch. This changes who we are through the Spirit in us. It changes our actions, our desires, our affections, our mind, everything that we are, should, and always must be God-focused. God-focused. Do we do that perfectly? No. Do we struggle? Yes. But is it easy for us to understand what that means? Of course it is. You wake up sometimes and you say, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the Lord. And you wake up and you put away your distractions and you focus on the Lord. You commune with the Lord. You study his word and the spirit is engulfing you. And you feel that praise and you're uplifted. And God is, is, is blessing you in your spirit. And your day starts off right. And then some days you're not with the Lord at all for days. You're, oh, I'm busy. I've got things to do. I, I've got to finish my show that I was watching. Or I need to do this. Or I need to do this. And God is sitting by the well waiting to say, will you sit with me and share your time with me? 
He said, we don't have to be at Gerizim. We don't have to be at Jerusalem. Wherever you are, I am. I am with you always, always. No place that I am not with you. But we have to make an effort to build that fellowship. Just like we do with our spouses here, except with God. <laughs> the blessings are always forthcoming. We know that he is going to always give those to us. But as we see that true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and that truth has to be from the word of God, that truth has to be that our object is Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit leading us to the Father. We're told that when we pray, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Well, I just read you, what happened in Congress, he did not properly pray to the Father through the Son. Some people say, well, then I guess, you know, it's just a dead prayer. And I told you, it's not. He's still invoking. He's still invoking. When we worship, we must understand proper worship because just as there are true worshipers that God has sought out, they, there are false Worshippers. That is what is implied. If there's true worshipers, what's that also mean? There's false worshipers. In Colossians 2, Paul addresses this. In verse 220, he says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, that's us. We were influenced by the enemy. We walked in the enemy steps. He said, do this, and we said, with joy. But we have died to the elemental spirits of the world. And he continues, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. The vain trappings of man. They have the appearance of religious things, but they lack the power thereof of truly godly actions. There's false worshipers all over. Turn on the TV. You'll see them. And this was what... I have musings. I wrote it here, my musings. I was in the shower today. I know you think sometimes he bathes regularly. Yes, it's true, I do. So I'm in the shower this morning, and I'm, I'm, I'm going over the sermon in my head. And I said to myself, you know what? When you speak in truth, you want it disseminated because we are commanded to do that. But if you are speaking falsehoods, do you want it disseminated? Now, I've studied Jehovah's Witnesses. I've studied the Mormons. I've studied other false religions. But I have studied them more from reading and watching apologists. So I said to myself, you know what's interesting? When I bring up a Bible verse, and I'm asking questions about Bible verse, verses in my studies, videos will usually pop up. Videos of other pastors preaching and teaching. And I think to myself, okay, some of them I know, some of them I don't. How come, and so I verified this this morning, how come you don't see sermons from the Mormons? How come you don't see sermons from the Jehovah's Witnesses? So I said, in my head, I'm in the shower, so I said, I need to check this out. So I went on my com computer, and I just typed sermons from Jehovah's Witnesses. Sermons from Mormons, LDS. Nothing. Nothing. Well, let me put some Bible verses in, some like John 3.16, and see if I can get some sermons then. Nothing. I thought to myself, isn't that fascinating? They know that the only time that they can control their false narrative is in a secret <laughs> cavalcade <laughs> type thing where they control the narrative and they control the questions. Now, I even looked for this this morning and I couldn't find it, so I'll paraphrase. But there's a famous 
um, Jehovah Witness who said that don't let the Je your um, young trainee, the person you're teaching, read the Bible on their own, especially the Christian Bible, for when they do, they leave us. They leave the Jehovah Witness faith because they find, he didn't add this part, but it's because they find the truth. I don't know if you know this, but they have, Jehovah Witnesses have their own Bible where they try and twist the truth. Mormons use other books. They only have the King James Bible on the side. But yet they won't let you hear what they teach unless you become part of them. I also decided to do it from mosques. Oh, you're not getting that from mosques. The one I did find that I found fascinating was Unitarians. But that's just philosophy. Has anybody ever heard a Unitarian sermon? <laughs> it's just philosophy. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. So they don't care. But you see, why do we proclaim it? We proclaim the truth because the Spirit in us says to do it. And we are ready to argue on the bedrock of God's absolute nature and His Word why we defend it from truth. But if we're teaching lies, if we're teaching deceit, we're not going to do that. I lastly did one last thing that I have to tell you that is so fascinating. I looked up the Church of Satan. And I've already done this before, but I said to myself, well, this is interesting. There's videos from the Church of Satan. Well, are they going to be honest? Well, of course not. They wouldn't be Satanists if they were honest, <laughs> because Satan is the father of lies and deceit. To be a good Satanist, you can't be honest. And if anybody's ever studied that, they're going to know that that's true. But I found that fascinating. They outright are telling you lies, and they are doing it in a public forum. Now, you don't get to see their rituals, but they will do their discussion. And I thought, isn't that just like the enemy? When they're distorting the word of God, he does it in secret. But those in full rebellion, come on. Come on and join us. It is so important to know what you believe and why. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way which seems right to a man. But the end is destruction. The end is perdition. So as we worship and aware of worship, I want us to remember an important thing. Just as God, and I went over this a minute ago, is spirit. We too are spirit. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The Spirit himself testifies in Roman with our spirit that we are children of God. For all who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. We are born not of flesh, but we are now born of spirit. You must be born of the Spirit to communicate with the Father, who is the Father in spirit and in truth. You know, it's interesting. The French have a proverb, and it says, a good meal ought to begin with hunger. It's hard to enjoy a meal when you are not hungry, but when you are hungry, anything tastes good. Now, for us, some of us think that we've gotten full, but we have the truth. We should be hungry, hungry, hungry. Seeking the truth. And then we go into a world where people are seeking it. They don't, some don't even know they're hungry, and many know they're hungry. And we can say, I can feed you. I first off fill you with God's living water and his living manna. It's so important for us to walk in the world properly. I, I'm, as I close here, I, I want to give a, a little bit of comfort. A few months ago, we, we, we looked at Isaiah 6. And Isaiah, the whole book, is, is so powerful. Our focus and our object is Christ. It starts in Isaiah 6 by saying, in that year King Uzziah died. In that year, King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it talks about the whole earth with the glory of the Lord, with the angel saying, holy, holy, holy. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. You know, our comfort, our security, our faith, our hope, our joy, our blessing is not found in any person. It's only found in God. King Uzziah was a good king. At the end, he made a mistake. But he was a good king. He was a prosperous king. He made Israel strong economically. He made them strong militarily. He was a powerful king. He was blessed by God. In the day or the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah's eyes were opened. I think we're in a time right now where we're going to have a, a, a mighty revival in the hearts of men, in the hearts of women, who are going to be looking to God because it appears that many of the blessings are going to be taken away, or have already been taken away. This opportunity to say, listen, I'm going to show you the who that I serve. I'm going to talk about the fact that the where is anywhere that you are. I'm going to be able to declare the gift that has been given, the prophecies that have been fulfilled. The God who is high and lifted up. Isaiah continues here, in verse 7, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me. This is him talking. He says, having his hand a burning coal that was taken with tongs from the altar, the altar of God in heaven. And he touched my mouth. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned. Verse 8 says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? And again, as I preached on a few months ago, Here I am, send me. We don't know what's coming, but we know who we serve. Our security is in the Lord. No matter what happens in this world, our security is in the Lord. Isaiah 51, 7 continues in this train of thought and says, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law, fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their rivalings. Verse 12, I am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, or the son of man who is made like grass? Even if they invoke the enemy in Congress, even if they try to stop the power of God's mighty hand through the churches and the spirit that dwells within all of us. Remember that Satan is always in retreat. The gates of hell will not prevent. It doesn't say the gates of heaven. God doesn't need gates. Satan cannot go anywhere. He is not allowed. The gates. He's always in defensive mode. We only see him in, in, in the world. We think, oh, he's so aggressive. And he is, but it's a defensive. He's the perfect passive aggressive. <laughs> he's just hoping he can do enough. But he's always on that thick leash. God is in control. That's who we serve. That's who we worship. A.T. Pearson wrote an amazing <laughs> study called Lessons in the School of Prayer. 
as I finish, I'm going to read this. It's a little long, but listen. Just relax a moment and listen to the power behind this man of God. He who rushes into the presence of God to hasten through a few formal petitions and then hastens back to the outside cares and pursuits does not tarry long enough to lose the impression of what is without and get the impress of what is within the secret chamber. He does not take time to fix his mind's gaze on the unseen and the eternal. Many a so-called praying man has never once really met and seen God in the closet. The soul disturbed and perturbed, tossed up and down and driven to and fro by worldly thoughts and cares can no more become a mirror to reflect God than a ruffled lake can become the mirror of the starry heights that arch above it. He who would look downward into his own heart depths and see God reflected there must stay long enough for the stormy soul to become calmed. Only when he first gives peace is the nature placid enough to become the mirror of heavenly things. But when such communion becomes real, prayer ceases to become a mere duty and becomes delight. All senses of obligation is lost in privilege. Love seeks the company of its object simply for the sake of being in the hunger of his presence. Just to be with you, Papa. Have any of us not known what it is to cultivate companionship for its own sake, mutely sitting in the presence of another whom we devotely love? And do we not love God enough to make it an object to shut ourselves in with Him at times just to enjoy Him? Is there no taint of selfishness in prayer which, which knows no there, uh, sorry, is there no taint of selfishness in prayer which knows no their motive than to ask for some favor? Jude counsels us to pray in the Holy Ghost as a means whereby we keep ourselves in the love of God. He who know the very ecstasies of the secret chamber there learns to keep himself in the love of God, finding therein the sunbeam whose light illumines, whose love warms whose life quickens. God's presence becomes the atmosphere he breathes and without which his spiritual life cannot survive. Such a habit of abiding in the presence of God and dwelling upon his glorious perfection develops a holy and enamoring love which can only say, I have but one passion and it is he and he alone. Lessons in the School of Prayer. Isaiah ends with one thought. Let us be grateful, therefore, for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. That's who we serve. That is the object of our worship. Where? Wherever we are. How? In developing our time and our thoughts devotedly to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we submit our lives to you every day, as we come before you and say, today I give myself to you, Lord. I submit all that I am to you. Use me for your glory. Take away these distractions. Take away these worldly vices and have my heart, my spirit, and my mind focused on you. As we are told and commanded that our affections are only on the great God of Israel, the great God who created all things with his hands, the great God who upholds all things with his hand, the only Alpha and Omega. Nothing contends with you. 
Nothing challenges you. And as we are in spirit, your children as well, we have the ability to fully commune with you. Let us recognize who we are and say, Father, reverent God, we serve you, we desire you. Everything that we have is yours. And when we say amen, we mean let it be so and all in agreement that our desire is always and foremost our devotion, taking captive all thoughts and all actions and all words to you and your truth and in your service. In Jesus' glorious and holy name we pray.